is a two-time MVP winner of this All-Star League. Hey, and welcome to the opening episode of Personal Foul. My name is Manuel. I'm Isaac. Yeah, this is our first episode of Personal Foul. Um, sorry for the delay. Um, production's been kind of slow. We've been trying to figure out this whole scheduling um, between me and him. I've you know? had to contact my agent several times, but we've come to an agreement. Yeah, it wasn't 50-50. I listen to you, Floyd. I listen to you, Floyd Mayweather. <laughs> I'm learning from you. You're my mentor, man. Never give up 50-50. Never. Especially when you're the main star, you're undefeated. Scott Boras, I see you. <laughs> All right. So we're going to lead in with our first story of the week. That's the Lakers versus the Heat. Yes, uh, we saw a very strong game by the Los Angeles Lakers, led by Kobe Bryant and his mask. Yeah, but it then, but it wasn't, it wasn't just Kobe though. It was also um, the reemergence of Ron Artest. I don't want to say Metal World Peace because that was the Metal World Peace playing us, and it was old fashioned Ron Artest out there playing defense and actually putting up good numbers with 17 points. And they had the big fella and Andrew Bynum with 16 points and 13 rebounds out there doing his thing. Also, notable contributions by Pau Gasol, who had double digit rebounds. And Al Drew Godlock, who had two consecutive threes in the first quarter to give the Lakers a bump. So what do you have to say about this game, Isaac? Well, I think this game has to be taken within the concept of... Uh, you have to look at this game from an objective standpoint and say, yeah, the Lakers won the game, but also know that Kevin Bosch wasn't playing, which is kind of surprising to talk about that he usually be talk about Wade and LeBron, the big two, and then Bosch. But in this case, I think Bosch being out there helped the Lakers' case because then you don't really have to card, draw Anthony... And um, Haslam is a pretty decent jump shooter, but he's not the jump shooter as Kev as uh, Chris Bosh is, and he could hit that 15-foot jump shot that would like, spread the floor and open up the lanes for LeBron and Wade to drive in. But let's talk about another very important storyline, and that was Dwayne Wade and Kobe Bryant. Uh, the foul, the broken nose. The broken nose, the uh, broken face almost of Kobe Bryant. <laughs> and what did we see from that game? From uh, Well, I think Kobe went out there, and he tried to... I think he tried to downplay it throughout the whole week that he didn't, he didn't feel it was personal that him and his weight are all good pals and everything's all good. But he came out there with a mission, dropping 18 points in the first quarter, going 8 for 10. I mean, Kobe was hitting, it was vintage Kobe. He just hit a jump shot after jump shot, taking Wade to the pose and telling him he can't guard him in the first quarter. That's what it looked out to me. And what do we have to say about Dwayne Wade? He was in foul trouble most of the game. He actually fouled out in the fourth quarter. Kobe Bryant actually... Limited his offensive play. Yeah, but I know what you got to say about that, though. You think the refs ones that took Wade out the game. It was this, a big conspiracy to take Wade out because he broke Kobe Bryant's nose and this stuff. Is, this is true. This is true. The uh, officiating was, well, particularly suspect, especially in the fourth quarter. We had very, two very ticky-tack fouls on Dwayne Wade, and that limited his time on the floor. Yeah, well, I'll give you those two. I'll give you two. I'll give you two. The one was Steve Blake was... I guess that was the charge. I think the Bynum one that you're talking about was a kind of ticky-tack foul. And also the only bunk Kobe when he's trying to go on that big way. That was a go either way. But still, Kobe did his thing on his way. I guess he won up them this time. All right, Isaac. So let's talk about the significance of this game. What can we say about the Lakers after this pretty impressive win in Los Angeles? Well, I think they're, they're on a good roll. I think they've won, I believe, six out of eight games so far. They've won three games since the All-Star break. And, it, and what it says is they're a good team on, uh, at home. They're, they're, I think, 17-2. and two, Only lost two games. Once to the Bulls. Thank you for ruining Christmas, Derrick Rose. <laughs> and the Indiana Pacers. The only two teams that beat the Lakers at home. So I think that's a good significance that they understand. But also Fisher's comments after the game when he said that they, the light finally went off. That they believe now in themselves through the trade talks and everything. They finally had that team meeting. And you know what? Forget what everybody's saying. We know we're going with this team. And that's the significance is that they finally beat a team that had a winning record and people... It was a signature win, I guess, so to speak, for the Lakers that they finally got that monkey off their back. They got that one win. But allow me to play devil's advocate, Isaac. Go for it. Kobe Bryant had a very strong offensive start, fell off in the second and third quarters. Is this offensive play by Kobe sustainable throughout the season? We've seen him struggle this season. I'm not sure if the Lakers can really hang in there if Kobe has a bad game or a bad stretch of games. Meta World Peace, as you said, at 17 points, but can we expect that uh, in the season as, as the season goes on? 
Well, I hope Kobe's watching this because if you if he, if he hears you saying that he can't sustain this, he's gonna sustain it for the rest of the season. <laughs> I mean, that's the way Kobe is. Remember, he shot like what forty eight against Phoenix. Like, but well, that's not bad for it, the seventh best player in the league. So I hope Kobe, you're listening. And prove this man wrong that you can't sustain it even though you are 33 years old and this is your 16th season in the league. You can still sustain it. As for World Peace, I don't think he can sustain it. I think it's it's great to see, but I don't think he can sustain 17 points a game. I don't see that happening. I think it would be great that he could at least average 10 points a game over 40% shooting from the three point line, which he's been doing that for the last five games or so. He's been shooting that well. If he can keep that up, it'll be a great plus for the Lakers. And I also think he should change his name back to Monarch Test and not to Meta World Peace, which Meta World Peace has been kind of a disappointment this season. I was Monarch like, Test wasn't that bad of a disappointment I, last to year. To be completely honest with you, before this season, I was expecting him to change his name to True Warrior. It didn't <laughs> happen. Meta World Peace is okay. But uh, let's talk about the Lakers moving forward. Is this type of play sustainable? Can they be expected to beat teams of this caliber as the season goes on? I think this team is is good. It's a good team. I think I mean, you have the big three in Bynum, Gasol, and Kobe. Those three guys are going to do their thing. The only thing is about the bench, and we said we we're talking about the role players of Ron Artest and Matt Barnes, Sher Murphy, uh, who else we have? Blake, Andrew Gallock. We don't know those guys can sustain their play. And as soon as they can when they're at home, the question is when they go on the road, can they sustain that? And with Fisher, if he can't give the Lakers anything, it will be a plus as well. So I don't know. It's it, it's a it's a fun role. But as Lakers fans, if you look at the win yesterday, and oh yes, the Lakers are unstoppable. They beat the Heat. You take that, Jane Wade, and you, you shove it in everybody's face that the Lakers are back. But you got to be some caution though, because I don't. The team is good, but I don't think they're good enough to win the title. If that's the, if that's what we're looking at now, is the Lakers. They're not good enough to win the title with the team that we have assembled. I don't think so either. And you did mention the three superstars, but one of the big questions in Lakerland is whether they're going to be in Los Angeles <laughs> come next week. So uh, let's talk about that for a second. Let's talk about the trade possibilities that the Lakers are looking at. Do you think, they, A, they should make a trade, and what type of trades are we talking about here? Well, I think they do need a trade. But I don't know. Jim Buss is a hard man to understand. I don't think he knows basketball at all. But, I mean, we do need a trade, but I think we got to understand either they want to win now, and if you win now, you don't trade none of the big three. You keep those big three. That's the reason why we, why we won the last two, because we had those those big three on our team. We need a, we don't need a big trade. I don't think we need that big that big splash, that big other star. We need a point guard or a three. That's the two weaknesses the Lakers have is on the three spot and the one. Either one of those holes we feel should help the team significantly. That's what I think. What do you think? You think, you think we need to get one of our, our big two guys? Our big seven I think it's I think it's definitely worth considering. The Lakers do have very big weaknesses at the point guard, at the small forward spot. But they don't have any trade pieces. The only trade pieces that they have, really, are the big three. So if you really want to fix the Lakers' Pau. deficiencies, you're going to have to trade one of them. Pau Gasol looks like he's going to be the target to go. I'm not very happy about that, but if this team wants to win... They have to let him go. He yesterday's game is just an example of Pau Gasol not being able to, you know, get an offensive consistency when the other two stars are scoring. He had struggled to score nine points yesterday, and he. Uh, it, it's very difficult to see him on the team and uh, being his efficient self with two other players but I think, the ball. But I think a lot has to do with, with the emergence of Final. Remember, the last two seasons that Final's been, been with the Lakers, so when they won, Final's been hurt. So it wasn't like Final's always been there before. It's, be, it's because now that Bynum's healthy, thank you. He's finally healthy, finally. Knock on what he says healthy. But, he, but because he's healthy, he needs to be on the post, and he needs to be on the block. But that takes away kind of Powell's game in the block. Because remember, in the fourth quarter, Bynum wasn't in the game. It was always it was always Lamar and Gasol. So Gasol will always be in the block. So I, I think that the fact that his numbers are are dwindling down is due to the fact that the emergence of Bynum has a lot to do with that. And I agree that the only assets they have are the big three. And we're not gonna get rid of Kobe because his contract is ridiculous. But that's another topic we'll get to later on. Bynum is Jim Buss's boy, so he ain't going anywhere. So Paul Gasol is all the man out. And the only problem I have with training Gasol is that we're giving away probably the most skilled seven footer in the game. And if you're gonna trade him, the you know this one of the corner wasn't in basketball is don't trade big for small. Never. Never, right? So we all know the trades we went down with CP3, who should have been the Laker, not a Clipper. 
Um, but the only way you check a saw is so you get that marquee point guard, that one point guard that's going to set you for the next five years or whatever after Kobe's gone. If you cannot trade him for a point guard that's an average point guard and an average small four, no, you got to trade him for a point guard that's going to be with the team for the long term. Which is why I say, if you're going to win with Kobe, win, him, win now. Kobe doesn't have that many years left. So you do the trades that's going to help your team win now, and you do whatever you got to do when Kobe retires, and you fix the pieces around that. That's what I say. That's the only problem I have with trading Gasol is that you need to get something that's not only going to help you now, but will help you in the future. Because like I said, we have no, no other assets on the team. But here, here's the thing. Uh, when you trade superstars, you never get a superstar back. We had a superstar called Shaquille O'Neal. I don't know if you've heard of him. And he but got it, traded it for... It did work out, though. It took us four years, but <laughs> it worked out. This is true. <laughs> but uh, let's look at the players that we got back. We got Lamar Odom, Karan Butler... First round draft pick, right? And although they were valuable, they didn't stick with the team for long. And you must get Brian Grant or something. Brian Grant, yeah, Brian Grant's him. expiring contract. Big piece of the puzzle. Big piece of the puzzle. But none of those players stuck, and none of those players were marquee players. And I think if you're going to trade Pau Gasol, you're not going to get a marquee player back. You're going to get a bunch of pieces back. Right, but you did get Lamar. Lamar actually did end up sticking around for those two championships and those other pieces so, that we got. We ended up trading. We ended up getting Kwame Brown. For all intents and purposes, he helped out the Lakers team significantly. So we all got to thank Kwame Brown because he got us Paul Gasol. So without him on our team, we don't get Paul Gasol. And he made Andrew Bynum the player. Oh, yeah. I mean, Tanya, you can score on Kwame Brown. You can score score on anybody in the league. You could be in the NBA if you could score on Kwame Brown. Okay, but let's talk about... um, Those rumors. Those rumors that are going on. That we've heard. What type of players are we talking about here? Well, by now, everybody's heard that the whole trade between um, Boston and L.A., two unlikely teams that will probably trade with each other, but it's between Rondo and Paul Gasol. That's basically the centerpieces of the trade. You know, you've heard different versions of it between Rondo, because Rondo and probably Jermaine O'Neal's contract for Paul Gasol makes no way work. And it's a good business move for the Lakers in the sense that by no, I don't know, I mean, Gasol's making $19 million a year. And he will continue making 19 and 20 in his third year of his contract. Last year of his contract, Rondo, on the other hand, is making $11 million a year. So, if you trade Gasol for Rondo, we'll probably another contract item to the Lakers, probably end up saving about $16 million a year. And they get a point guard and a pretty good point guard in Rondo. Whether or not you think he's an all star, he's a legitimate one of the best point guards in the league, that's a different thing. Another thing you've got to consider is, is are the Lakers willing to build a team around Rondo? as one of their main centerpieces because if Boston's training them, that's kind of telling you something that they don't think Rondo's that type of piece that, that should be built around. This is true. And then one of the other wrinkles of this trade is that this is really the only trade that is bringing back a player that has arguably marquee caliber talent. Right. So um, the Rondo deal is there, but Rondo's been linked to a bunch of other teams. I don't necessarily see that trade happening. Yeah, me either. And uh, we also... Beg to bring up the fact that uh, Rondo can't shoot the ball. Yeah, but I, th- that, could I th- <laughs> that could be a problem. Yeah, I think he has to shoot the ball in basketball. That's I, on my check. I think so too, and that's the type of player that the Lakers need at point. We need a good hey, defender. But he did good 15, was 15, 15, and 20 or something in the last game. The only person who did that was Oscar Robinson and Will Chamberlain. He's an elite company. Yeah, and I think Kobe will will get in his face and tell him you better shoot that ball. I, I think that's what I think that's what he needs because. Probably KG's all, all bark but no bite. True. And then there are other issues with Rondo as well. Um, he's linked to certain attitude problems. Uh, <laughs> those days in Boston, right? Oh, that's, that shouldn't be a problem. We have and Kobe on our team, Ron Artez, Matt Barnes. That's all our team is. A bunch of attitude problems. A bunch of problems. volatile personalities. Yeah. Um, so. But hey, we have the best coach for that too. We have Mike Brown. If you haven't noticed, one of the first things I, I noticed the difference between Mike Brown and Phil Jackson Mike Brown gives out hugs during the game. And kisses. And kisses. And he says, good job. Good job. So maybe that's what Ronald needs. He needs a hug. If he needs a hug, come to LA and Mike Brown will give you a hug, Rondo. He will give you a hug. He will. He will. And he's the perfect offensive coach for Rondo. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, wait. I think that's Kobe's job. Yeah, 